say that was a little close. You're right. In 1939, the English, the French, the Burmese, almost everybody in the world made movies. It was the most pervasive industrial art since the invention of printing. It dealt in heroic proportions. But the Canadians were not interested in myth-making, and so they let the Americans make their movies for them. The Americans did a good job. Before Hollywood, after all, the Mountie was just another cop. Wonderful country, Canada. You get used to it. To make these movies, it was not considered necessary to actually go to Canada. A director would say, has anybody here seen Canada? And there was generally somebody on the set who could help. The history of the Canadian motion picture up to 1939 was largely contained in the reports of bankruptcy proceedings from Victoria to St. John, New Brunswick. Almost all the movie theaters were under the monolithic control of Hollywood, and they made their money showing American pictures. There was, it is true, a government motion picture bureau, but some 13 years after the talkies were invented, the Bureau was still having trouble getting the money for proper sound equipment. Canada's private producers could meet comfortably in a very small hotel room. Ben Norrish, Leon Shelley, Gordon Sparley, Budge Crawley. International recognition was limited to an obscure American prize awarded to Budge Crawley for a movie about the scenic aspects of his honeymoon. Although Sparling and others had made a few popular short films, they were doing it on a shoestring. Landscape was still Canada's chief contribution to the culture of the Western world. One man in government finally got sick and tired of it. Ross McLean, a junior diplomat at the Canadian High Commission in London, noted in a memo that the only Canadian movies he had to show the English depicted Canada not as a country where Canadians live and work, but a place where wealthy Americans come to play. Elsewhere in the world, the tired old travelogue was being replaced by a dynamic new art form. Benjamin Britten was doing music for it. W.H. Auden was writing for it. Letters of thanks, letters from banks, letters of joy from the girl and the boy, received bills and invitations to inspect new stock or visit relations with applications for situations and timid lovers, declarations and gossip, gossip from all the nations, new circumstantial news, financial letters with holiday snaps to enlarge in, letters with faces scrawled in the margin, letters from uncles, cousins and aunts, letters to Scotland from the south of France, letters of condolence to Highlands and Lowlands. Its directors were already legendary. Robert Flaherty in America, the Dutchman Joris Evans. Leni Riefenstahl in Nazi Germany, the Scotsman John Grierson. It was Grierson who gave it a name. He called it the documentary. And Ross McLean convinced Prime Minister Mackenzie King to invite John Grierson over to Canada. On March 16, 1939, on Grierson's recommendation, the Canadian cabinet brought to Parliament an act to establish a national film board to make the documentary. Six years later, Ottawa was the documentary capital of the world. But nothing much might have happened had it not been for the outbreak of the Second World War. The motion picture was a primary propaganda tool, and Mackenzie King needed movies in a hurry. Grierson had not had time to set up shop. He called the American producer Louis de Rochemont, 
whose enormously successful documentary series, The March of Time, was running in 10,000 theaters across North America. He talked Orochimo into calling his next show, Canada at War, and producing it with the Canadian government. And here, more than anywhere else, the visitor can feel the national determination of 11 million citizens of the Dominion of Canada who in their own right have taken up arms at the side of Britain and France to fight a war which they believe is in a just cause. A war in which they are confident that the strength and resources of their new world nation will be a mighty factor in bringing victory and peace. To make movies, Grierson would use anyone who could help. Even the Prime Minister's private secretary, Walter Turnbull, soon found himself in the middle of show business. I was asked to go down to New York and see the rushes and the general setup. And um, I did have one slightly amusing experience since it was new to me. As a person with a tin ear, I found it necessary to direct the orchestra in the playing of a Canada because their tempo was wrong. So here was Turnbull up waving his arms, trying to give them what I thought was the correct beat. Grierson had a unique problem. Although Mackenzie King had run Canada for the better part of 20 years and seemed destined to run it to his grave and perhaps even beyond, nobody in Canada seemed to like him. But Grierson knew that a war needed a leader. One of his jobs was to invest Mackenzie King with the image of the noble warrior. The Prime Minister was not an accomplished speaker. It is not the existence of less powerful nations alone, nor the freedom of Europe alone that is at stake. It is the existence... Thank you, sir. It is against these forces which threaten the existence of free nations. No, I can't do it. The coverage of the Prime Minister eventually moved the loquacious member of Parliament, Jean-Francois Pouliot, to flights of parliamentary eloquence. I am told that the pictures taken by the film board of the Prime Minister are as numerous as the posterity of Abraham, as the stars in the sky or the sand in the sea. Photograph from the right, photograph from the left, photograph right in front, some photograph backward. They even do profile photographs. The camera up and down. This explains the sudden rise to power of this newcomer, John Grierson. But no matter how often Grierson trundled King before the cameras, he could never hope to match a single performance by Winston Churchill one winter afternoon in Ottawa. Of all of Churchill's ringing wartime utterances, the only one ever recorded on film was captured that day by cameramen of the National Film Board. When I warned them that Britain would fight on alone, whatever they did, their generals told their prime minister and his divided cabinet, in three weeks, England will have her neck wrung like a chicken. Some chicken. <laughs> In the early days, not only the best performances, but the writing and directing of film board movies was largely in the hands of British imports. Stanley Hawes, Raymond Spottiswood, Stuart Legg provided the creative leadership. Where there was Canadian talent, he used it. He needed music, and he got Lucio Agostini of Montreal. He needed a voice and he got the booming resonances of Lorne Green. Lorne, would you give us a level, please? One, two, three, four. Here's more copy, Mr. Green. Okay, kid, out of the studio. Just one minute to go. From Airfield, 
sails all along the conquered coasts of Europe, wave on wave of Goering's bombers launch their long-awaited assault on England. A typical early film was called Churchill's Island. With this movie, the National Film Board of Canada became a household name. In those fateful autumn days of 1940, when none knew what terror the skies might hold, there appeared from end to end of Britain the strangest fighting force the world has ever seen. An army of citizens, self-organized, self-disciplined, And even before the droning engines of the Luftwaffe heralded the first mass attacks, this people's army of Britain stood ready. Oscar night in Hollywood. 1941 winners include Gary Cooper for Sergeant York, Joan Fontaine for Suspicion, Orson Welles for Citizen Kane, and a happy surprise, the National Film Board of Canada for the documentary Churchill's Island. A big night in Tinseltown for the Dominion to the north. An Academy Award was delivered to the Department of Public Works representative at the abandoned sawmill on the Ottawa River, which served as the studios of the National Film Board of Canada. The man who made Churchill's Island and Grierson's key lieutenant in the theatrical world was the brilliant English writer and editor Stuart Legg. Legg worked with a Hollywood distributor. He would see a rough cut with me, and the lights would go up. It'd be a long silence. And then Dave would sigh, and he'd say, Stuart, I gotta sell this crap. Oh, yeah. Say, who is this proudest girl in the world? What's it all about? Yes, where is she? I'm the proudest girl in the world. Sure, I'm proud. Can't you tell? This is the latest fashion for Mademoiselle. I'm the proudest girl in the world. There are lots of reasons to why I'm in. With every soldier I'm out to win. We're out to build a shorter road into Berlin. That's why I'm proud. The few Canadian filmmakers that existed were working for private companies or shooting for the armed forces. Grierson had to build a propaganda army with no professional talent. Stanley Jackson, a quiet school teacher, found himself directing movies for five dollars a day. Then there was the budding botanist Guy Glover. Gudrun Parker, who wrote a woman's column for the Winnipeg Free Press. A couple of tough Jewish kids, Sid Newman and Julian Rothman. Chemists, poets, rich kids, and con men. To make certain they didn't turn into government bureaucrats, Grierson put them on three months' contracts and told them to make good movies or get out. The survivors flourished. Tom Daly, whose only show business experience was playing the part of Neville Chamberlain in a college musical with Wayne and Schuster, was transformed into one of the finest film editors in the world. Somebody gave me a letter to John Grierson, whose name I didn't know. And I put it at the bottom of the list because I didn't know anything about films. Having tried everything else, I ended up in his office just to see what there was. And um, he was homesick. But the next day, his secretary called me and said he would see me at home. And that changed my whole opinion of a government servant who would see you at home when he was sick. I thought to myself, well, that's interesting. In Ottawa, where culture consisted largely of the little theater and the occasional touring cellist, these strange creatures in ascots and sandals were the subject of considerable curiosity. They were definitely not your typical civil servant. But no one could deny the fact that millions of Canadians saw their movies and loved them. Canadian audiences were heard to cheer when they saw the NFB logo come on the screen before the MGM Lion, the snow-capped peak of Paramount, or the great Klieg lights that heralded the works of 20th Century Fox. The nation rises as one man to preserve that which he knows and loves. The sleepy Laurentian village, the red earth of Prince Edward Island, where first the Fathers of Confederation met. 
the glory of the open prairie, symbolic of the new world's freedom, and the great mountains of the West, a vast inheritance of hope and promise. To preserve and protect all that she holds dear, Canada, at the end of the war's first year, accepts the challenge of total warfare and stands on guard, for she knows that only thus will she survive. The film board gave Canada its first cult figure since Grey Owl. A modest genius was at work in the sawmill. Norman McLaren drew pictures and sound directly on film. It was a revolutionary new technique, and it astonished the world of the cinema. But for the time being, McLaren's great art was dedicated to selling war bonds. the most important employees of the film board were an anonymous collection of women known simply as the pirates. An essential element of wartime propaganda films were shots of the Allied armies and more importantly shots of the enemy. The job of the pirates was to beg, borrow or steal from friends and enemies. Ottawa became one of the world's great repositories of global war footage. The amount of film material which was shot by the governments who were involved, by the armed forces, by the propaganda agencies and so on of the belligerents was absolutely fabulous. It was incredible the amount of footage that was being turned out. There was all that stuff coming in from the Allies. Then, of course, you had the captured material, German, Italian, Japanese, which arrived by all kinds of sort of weird, odd, roundabout routes via Stockholm, via Lisbon. It was Tolstoyan sitting in the theater, looking, you know, at 40, 50,000 feet of film at a time. It was like war and peace. Perhaps the greatest coup of the pirates was the seizure of a negative of the Nazi masterwork, Triumph of the Will. In 1934, Hitler's propaganda minister, Goebbels, had mobilized the entire German motion picture industry under Hitler's favorite director, Leni Riefenstahl, to create a monumental documentary aimed at terrifying potential enemies of Nazi aggression. In the hands of the Canadians, triumph of the will was turned against Nazi Germany. It was used in a dozen different films to illustrate the monstrosity of Adolf Hitler. Within a year, the little painter from Austria was gazing down upon the gigantic spectacle of a nation molded to his own brooding image. But the spectacle that Hollywood might have staged for a show, Goebbels staged to dope the human spirit. With the blood flag of the Munich Putsch in his left hand, with the cold stare of hatred in his eyes, he blessed the mystic standards and bestowed upon their bearers the bullies' right to kick their fellow men around. On my faith, and your work, he said, 
we shall build our new Germany. There was an occasion when we'd been making the world in action for a bit, when two of them, by some roundabout route, probably through Stockholm, got to Berlin and were seen by Goebbels. And it was fairly reliably reported that when the lights came up afterwards, Goebbels nodded and said, mm hmm, not bad. Then we were in the big time. One of Grierson's toughest propaganda jobs was to convince Quebec to join the war. The brutal conscription tactics of World War I had left much of Quebec lukewarm to the Second World War. To make recruiting films for Quebec, Grierson, with limited success, used soft cell drama. Grierson did little to develop filmmakers in French Canada. He largely fed Quebec translations of his English language films. He also did nothing to encourage feature filmmaking. Grierson felt that this field should be left to the British and the Americans. A British contribution was the 49th Parallel, the story of a Nazi U-boat crew in Hudson's Bay. Fine work, Herr. Magnificent, Herr Commandant. So the curtain rises on Canada. Do not forget, you are the first of the German forces to set foot on Canadian soil. Today, Europe. Tomorrow, the whole world. The U-boat is sunk, and the Nazi survivors are thrown into contact with a French-Canadian, played by Laurence Olivier. What sort of crook are you, and they, oh, what's the game? Have you people in Canada not heard that there's a war on? <laughs> yeah, sure, we hear their war on. <laughs> German. Yes, German. We are German. Okay, why yell about it? Monsieur Gompri, you German. I'm Canadian, he Canadian and he Canadian. My father fight against you last time. We give you one good licking then and we do it again. Grierson saw the power of Canadian film, not in terms of blockbuster features, but in small, easily transportable movies starring the common man. He had the foreigner's acute sense of Canada's extraordinary geography. 11 million people stretched out over three and three quarter million square miles. Where there were no movie theaters, Grierson created them. He hired a man called Don Buchanan, and Buchanan organized a vast network of traveling film shows. This was a true people's theater. It was unique in all the world, and at its peak, it reached a million Canadians a month. Soon, the circuits extended to factories and union halls. The projectionists would bring back suggestions to the filmmakers, and Grierson had a dream. We're going to concentrate far more on information from the people to the government than from the government to the people. It's dangerous, of course, but personally, I don't give a damn. To realize his sometimes noble ambitions, Grierson was quite prepared to employ ignoble tactics. When a naval officer was reluctant to give him ships for a movie, Grierson would bring out his cameras and film the officer, who was then easily persuaded to provide the necessary ships to go with the shots of himself. Grierson would then, of course, throw away the shots of the officer. And by the time he discovered he was just another face on the cutting room floor, the ships were steaming across the screens of the nation. Inevitably, Grierson picked up a lot of enemies along the way. 
disgruntled civil servants fed material to Mackenzie King's political opponents. Mitchell Hepburn, the Premier of Ontario, received this letter from Leo Dolan, one of Mackenzie King's senior civil servants. Dolan wrote in part, This guy, Grierson, is the smoothest likely to come here in years. He has had the inside path with your pal, Willie King. I know that these New York Jews are always with Grierson, and I'm convinced the little bastard is an English Jew. This whole film board setup should be investigated. I know they have had some queer dealings, but of course I can't get the dope as I would want it. If the right kind of questions are asked in the House, some enlightening information should be forthcoming. There were some returns filed last year that should make interesting reading. My best for the new year and always, sincerely yours, Leo. But Grierson kept one step ahead of the enemy. He was not an easy target. He moved fast, and he was lucky. Grierson wanted to get Canadian movies into American theaters. He was in the middle of negotiations when his filmmakers handed him the perfect picture. Believed to be the world's most powerful fortress, Pearl Harbor... War Clouds in the Pacific had been released in Canadian theaters, and it contained an uncanny prophecy of Japanese war strategy. Limited in cruising range to some 1,500 miles and mounting less than 100 heavy caliber guns, the tactic of the Japanese battle fleet must be to strike swiftly and hard before the combined strength of the United States and Britain can be massed against it. Three weeks later, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and war clouds in the Pacific became a smash hit. United Artists signed up for a whole Canadian series it played in 7,000 American theaters every month, and for the first and only time, Canadian film had mass American exposure. The Americans had Pearl Harbor. The Canadians had Hong Kong. The Japanese sneak attack destroyed three Canadian regiments, and the Japanese audiences enjoyed a film called The Surrender of Hong Kong. The cameramen of the Canadian Armed Forces had no great victories to put on film. The bulk of the Canadian Army had been sitting in England for more than two years with nothing to do. Canadian morale was at rock bottom, and the ingenuity of the Army film unit was running a bit thin. Each of our divisions has its own washing machine, a giant laundry on wheels. And I've seen one of them wash and dry my platoon's clothes while we were in for a swim, all within an hour. August 19, 1942, Canada's European army finally went into action. And once again, it was covered exclusively by enemy cameras. The infantry des deutschen Küstenschutzes geht zum Gegenstoß vor. Der Feind ist zurückgeworfen. Canadian cameramen had not been allowed on the raid. It was probably just as well. The raid on Dieppe was a military disaster. 900 Canadians were killed, 2,000 were captured, and Nazi Germany had a nice little newsreel. The movie on Dieppe finally released to Canadian theaters, used heavily censored shots from the German newsreel and Canadian footage shot during training exercises on the beaches of Scotland. The force I was in carried through to its objective under terrific fire and did what it had to do. Those nine hours ashore seemed like nine minutes. In the interests of home front morale, the facts were distorted and Dieppe became an item tucked away in an innocuous newsreel. And when we sailed away, 
We left the littered beaches to remind the Germans that we had punched one hole in Hitler's fortress and that it wouldn't be the last. We were back in Britain again. There was a little time for relaxation, but even our relaxation was an active one. Our fellows played football with English and Norwegian teams or held their own inter-regimental sports. Perhaps not up to Olympic game standard, but darn good fun anyway. Within a year, Canadian cameras were getting action footage that could be released back home. Movies of the Canadian victory at Ortona were among the finest ever shot. It was a Canadian cameraman who captured the classic images of D-Day as the final assault on Hitler's fortress began. Six Canadian cameramen lost their lives. Eleven others were wounded recording Canada's war effort. John Grierson had been looking beyond the war. It was, he said, the century of the common man, and he wanted to involve Canadian audiences with the larger global issues. Here, Grierson was on dangerous ground. He was getting into politics. A film on Canada's wartime ally, Russia, had already got him into trouble. And to a Europe already beneath the heel of the conqueror, the new Russia sent a message of hope. Our task is to pull poverty and darkness and slavery out by the roots. Herein lies our strength. One for all and all for one. Inside, fighting Russia was banned in Quebec and questions were asked in the House. There has been a growing suspicion that the film board has become a propagandist for a type of socialist and foreign philosophy. My objection is that we have a national instrument of government that is putting out Soviet propaganda. Yes, we were accused of being communists and, and all the rest of it. Uh, one has to remember at that time that Russia was an ally and an ally of enormous importance. Uh, in holding off the, the, uh, the, the main German forces for several years from Western Europe. And um, uh, um, I think there was a good deal of cause to be friendly to Russia and to, to face the reality that here we were. Uh, uh, we might not approve of their politics, but we approved of their soldiery. And come what may on this 2,000 mile battlefront. We didn't really know about the terror, the, the Stalinist terror. And though it didn't negate the whole film by any means, I think it, if you looked at it now, I think you'd find that the end looked rather naive. And today, across the vast spaces of steppe and tundra, the men and women of the new Russia are reading the message which the red star, shining from the smoky windows of giant munitions plants, sends forth into the night. We are strong because we have a faith. On February the 6th, 1946, only six months after the atom bomb brought the Second World War to its conclusion, the Cold War began. And it began in the capital of Canada. The Russian cipher clerk, Igor Gushenko, fled the Russian embassy bearing evidence of a communist spy ring involving a member of parliament, a government scientist, and seven other prominent Canadians. The key agents were attempting to steal the secrets of the atomic bomb, and they were duly convicted. But there were passing references to other Canadians in the Russian documents, and they were marched to a secret tribunal for questioning. One of them was John Grierson. The Russian documents had suggested that one of Grierson's secretaries was a spy, 
and that Grierson could be used to help her get a more sensitive job at the National Research Council. Grierson denied any implication, and no charges were ever laid. But the forward progress of John Grierson as a prime mover in the world of cinema ended that day. Smeared with guilt by association, Grierson was finished in North America. The man he had photographed so heavily over the years was not about to come to his assistance. And I would find it difficult to begin to understand them if I didn't know as much of their hearts as I do. I wonder if we could have these lights out. I can't see anyone that I'm talking to. But uh, it would be a great help if we could. And by the time Grierson left, uh, he was treated in a, such a shabby way that I don't think I've ever felt so disgusted at the Canadian government as I did then. When it came time to turn Canada's great spy scandal into a motion picture, it was 20th Century Fox who came to Ottawa to do it, with Dana Andrews starring as Igor Bushenko in Behind the Iron Curtain. Mackenzie King thought it was very good. They went to a gay restaurant. Bushenko discovered that Canadians were a happy people. No, you need people in the right places. The Army, the Air Forces, the Navy, the National Research Council, the Department of External Affairs. Good night, gentlemen. House of Commons, members' entrance. Good evening, John. The invasion of 20th Century Fox did not greatly concern Canada's private producers. There were now enough of them to form an association, but their objectives were limited. And um, the AMPPLC were not interested in joining anybody to fight the Americans, particularly at that time, or to try to lobby the government to, say, quotas or levy or whatever, because they couldn't compete in the production market with a product. No way. The big movie business in Canada was government business, and this was controlled by the National Film Board. The private producers argued that with the war's end, the NFB should fold its tent. Government films could be made more efficiently by private enterprise. Well, it was really an attempt uh, for the commercial, the, the free enterprise people, you know, the private sector, to. Um, uh, get together to try to get more work from the film board or from government sources, really. But the government decided to keep the film board going and the private producers continued as best they could. Associated Screen News made shorts for the theaters. 1947 will long be remembered as the year of the great controversy. Will they be long or will they remain short? But the style makers win, as usual, with their lengthy arguments in favor of the new look. Signs of revolt over rising prices are spearheaded by the Dominion small fry. They say candy sellers are sabotaging the sweet tooth, and what this country needs most is a good five-cent chocolate bar. With the movie theaters devoted to the American product, and the NFB getting most of the government money, the private producers had to rely on big business for sponsorship. But Canadian banks and big industry were not interested in high-risk feature movies. They would only lay out money for movies which glorified their image or pushed their product. You see, banks deal in money. Now, money isn't everything, but it sure helps make the community go. In business, money is like, uh, like, well, it's like the blood in the human body. It flows all through. And the nervous system, just like the light and power wires. 
you might say that each one of the human organs is like uh, some business or activity around Mapleville. Now take the heart here. That's something like the bank. If the institutions of Canada were like the organs of the human body, the film industry was located below the belt and somewhat to the rear. In this cultural climate, it was therefore a significant demonstration of perseverance and talent when Crawley filmmakers, working in their spare time, fashioned a beautifully evocative work based on Indian legend, which fascinated movie audiences all over the world. It was called The Loon's Necklace. As far as the movie business was concerned, Quebec was a province unlike the others. There were no films for children. Since 78 children had died in the Laurier Palace Theater fire of 1927, no one in Quebec was allowed into a movie theater under the age of 16. Whereas the rest of the world was growing up with Shirley Temple, Mickey Mouse, Snow White, and The Wizard of Oz, many of the children of Quebec never laid eyes on them. The theaters remained closed to children for 33 years. In spite of the fact that a, a young lady could be legally married at 14, she could be a mother at 15, but she couldn't attend the movies with her father or mother, even for a Walt Disney picture. Unlike English Canada, the Quebec establishment understood the power of film and took a deep interest in the movie business. Both the Catholic Church and the state supported producers who made films which propagated the faith or promoted a love of the land. Back in the 30s, l'abbé Maurice Prou, a priest who had learned filmmaking in Rochester, New York, had worked three years in the Abitibi directing a feature documentary to promote colonization of the Quebec Northland. The purpose of the film was to encourage wives to join their husbands and raise their families in the spirit of the pioneer. En Pays Neuf was a film with a message. Most of the Quebec entertainment films had come from Paris, but with the war and the Nazi occupation of France, this source dried up. There was a captive audience waiting for a producer. Alexandre de Sèvres, who ran a dairy and owned some movie theaters, used to give away tickets with his butter. He soon found it wasn't necessary. Quebec wanted to go to the movies. De Sèvres, with a fine sense of the power of Catholicism, went into movie production in partnership with the church. He had a spiritual advisor, l'abbé Vaché, who promoted the company's shares from the pulpit on Sunday and sold them in the sacristy after mass. De Sèvres envisaged a holy trinity consisting of the church, the state, and De Sèvres. In 1946, the film studios went up on Cotonage Road in Montreal, and there were even rumors that the Pope himself would appear in one of de Sèvres' pictures. But when it came to actually making movies, he fell back on the old tried and true action formula that had been the Canadian trademark in the silent film era. Rescue from the rushing northern waters. De Sèvres made one concession to God. The rescuers in his films were always good Catholics. Dessert made four features from 1946 to 1951 
and for a time, they made money. But the other big Quebec producer, Paul Langlais, thought Desseve and Vacher were doomed from the start. L'Abbé Vacher was selling Catholic films, and I don't think you can sell Catholic films any more than you can sell Catholic shoes. Paul Longley was Canada's most ambitious film producer since the advent of the talkies. In 1946, he and his partner, René Germain, built themselves a studio and produced a hit thriller for three quarters of a million dollars. It was called La Forteresse. Maintenant, vous savez tout, mais vous ne parlerez pas. Peut-être, peut-être, mais maman, même vous taillerez. Attendez, net. Réfléchissez. Vous n'avez pas d'appétit. On saura que vous n'étiez pas au concert, que vous n'étiez pas chez vous. Réfléchissez. Ce n'est pas le moment de réfléchir. Plus tard, mon cerveau sera libre. Beaucoup plus libre. Marie, Marie. Un accident. Il faut que ça ressemble à un accident. I will not let anything stand in the way of your success. Not anything. Of our success, sir. Langley hoped to reach beyond the French market. With La Forteresse, Langley became one of the first producers in the world to double shoot a movie in two languages with a separate cast. For the English version, he brought in two substantial Hollywood names, Paul Lucas and Helmut Dantin. I understand this is your first visit to Canada, isn't it, Helmut? Yes, it is, Paul, and a wonderful experience. It was called Whispering City. It opened in Alabama, and it didn't get much further. Longley learned the hard realities of the movie business in English-speaking North America. We could control our distribution. Mm -hmm. In La Forteresse, we could not control it in the English version. And there are, I won't call it rackets, but there are methods of distribution that are worldwide, uh, where unless you're a very expert uh, producer, you cannot get in from under. Longley went back to French language production, where with tight budgets, the right picture could still make a little money. Quebec had its own mythology, and Longley used it. If Hollywood could make millions with westerns, Langlais would make northerns. <laughs> Serafin, based on a popular radio serial, delighted the Quebec audiences. Ben, 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 voyons, voyons, monsieur le maire. Pas de progrès, pas d'avancement, pas d'avancement, pas de progrès. The dialect and the humor was Quebecois, and the audiences knew and loved each character. It might not have meant much to the rest of the world, but it meant a lot to the people of Quebec. Seven other features were turned out by small companies, but one was in a class by itself. The most beloved character in the culture of Quebec was Gracien Gélina, whose stage play Ticoc had been a huge success in both French and English Canada. Gélina brought Ticoc to the movie theaters. <laughs> Ticoc was the story of a little Quebecois who had returned from the war to find that the woman he loved had been forced into an arranged marriage with another man. Although she was desperately unhappy and wanted to rejoin Ticoc, a priest finally convinced her that divorce was not possible. Écoute, 
mon ami. Puis tu sais, dans le fond, que j'ai raison de partir avec elle. Et tiens, après, tu me suis. Ça fait que tu ne pourras pas faire autrement que de me parler du bon Dieu puis de ses commandements. Avec des péchés au bout gros comme le bras. Tu peux y aller, mais je te préviens que tu perds ton temps puis ta salive. Je te parlerai pas de religion. Non. Parce que le péché, où es-tu? On était fait là-dedans, nous autres, les papas. C'est notre père, le péché. C'est lui qui nous a mis au monde. Ça qu'on le connaît. Puis il nous en impose moins qu'au reste de la chrétienté. Mon Dieu, je m'arrange avec lui quand t'as revenu, puis je suis tranquille. Parce qu'il y a l'esprit là, je ne comprends pas le bon sens. Il nous a introduit sur la terre en cachette par la porte en arrière. Il trouvera bien le moyen de me sentir au paradis de la même façon. Puis la preuve, c'est que le commandement, père et mère, tiens là. Ça n'a rien à voir avec les gars de Est-ce qu'il y a un commandement qui ne me regarde pas, il peut y en avoir deux. Québec dwarfed the rest of Canada in feature film production. It embraced its stars and celebrated its culture without self-consciousness or embarrassment. The Klieg lights pierced the night sky over world premieres, and even if the world was confined to an area between Hull and Rimouski, Quebec actors and writers could actually make a living. In English Canada, a typical year was 1946. The Americans made 422 feature films. Burma made 46. English Canada made one. Bush Pilot, produced in Toronto for $160,000, was one of the few English-Canadian features in the entire post-war era to get any distribution at all. Anything for me in the afternoon train, Sam? Yeah. Nitro. Where is it? Chuck took it. Chuck took it? You let that kid handle Nitro? Look here, Red. He insisted on taking it. I couldn't let that stuff lie around the office until you felt like calling for it. Do you know what's happened? Chuck's taken the light plane and decided to deliver that stuff himself. The air's rough this evening. One good bump could explode that Nitro. English Canada had its radio stars. The nation stopped to listen to the happy gang, Alan Young, Jake and the Kid. Andrew Allen's Sunday night drama series on the CBC ranked with the finest in the world. Canadian writers like Mitchell, Peterson and Shul, performers like Draney, Mallet, Tweed and Knapp. But none of it got on the movie screens. And unlike Quebec, there was no language barrier and the Hollywood product overwhelmed the screens of the nation. Every other developed nation had intervened to ensure that Hollywood did not totally dominate their movie screens. The French and English had a quota system. The Danes, the Swedes, the Indians. All of them had some sort of government legislation that protected, for reasons of national identity, their native movie industry. Canada was alone in permitting Hollywood to control without interference the distribution of motion pictures. On the balance sheets of Hollywood, Canada was not even listed as a foreign country. She was considered the 49th state. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here is Mr. Haskell Masters, chief representative in Canada of Warner Brothers, through whose cooperation Danny Kay is appearing in Toronto. Mr. Masters had the responsibility of bringing Mr. Kay to this country, and is your company satisfied with the way things are going, sir? Everything is just wonderful. Danny Kay has cooperated in every manner possible, and I'm sure that everybody's going to like Danny Kay's picture, Inspector General, one of the finest musical comedies in Technicolor that Danny Kay has made. Canadians paid nearly a hundred million dollars a year to go to the movies. The Americans controlled over 90% of the screen time. The biggest piece of the action was owned and operated by Paramount Pictures through a Canadian subsidiary, Famous Players. They were all quite properly finding more and more ways to make money. With the post-war boom, the drive-in theater was invented and revolutionized teenage sex. The candy counter was introduced, 
and theater owners soon found out they made even more money from popcorn than they did from movies. Hollywood loved Canada. Adolf Zucker, Louis B. Mayer, Roy Rogers, and Trigger. They all loved Canada. The wilderness is calling north of the great divide. From everywhere it's calling north of the great divide. And it tells of rivers of silver, mountain peaks as high as eyes can see, where a man has lots of elbow room with his dog for company. In Canada, the only man to attempt to divert the rivers of silver and gold came from England in the person of J. Arthur Rank of Odeon. Rank had built a thriving industry with stars like Stuart Granger and James Mason. Rank didn't see any reason why they couldn't share the Canadian gold mine with the Americans. Boys and girls of Canada, I bring you greetings from the boys and girls of Britain. It's a great moment for me to be present at the first Canadian Saturday morning movie club here in Toronto. I know that very soon you will have movie clubs all over Canada as we have all over Britain. The only Canadian of any real consequence in the feature film business was the Minister of Trade and Commerce, C.D. Howe. Mr. Howe never went to the movies, but he did balance Canada's books. And in 1947, Howe discovered an alarming imbalance of payments with the United States. He had to stop the flow of Canadian dollars to the U.S. He ordered tariffs, custom duties, and freezes of American profits. Excise taxes were slapped on the importation of lettuce, cabbage, and carrots. When he got around to the movie business, he noted that Hollywood was taking $20 million a year out of Canada. It seemed at last, if only for reasons of hard cash, the Liberal government would finally have to lower the boom on Hollywood and force them to open Canadian theatres to Canadian movies. Paul Langlais, the pioneer Quebec producer, tried to push the case. C.D. Howe, he was a bulldozer in lots of respects, but he had to be convinced of the motive for his bulldozing. And I never could get to him. I had no access to him. And the people that I trusted to get to him, or that we trusted to get to him, uh, it did not obviously get to him, or if they did, they failed. He never put his shoulder to the wheel, so far as I'm concerned, at any time. On the contrary, he seemed to be the creature, creature or creature of uh, the majority of the American interests, and they were varied and plentiful in Canada, you know. The head of the film board, Ross McLean, and his assistant, Ralph Foster, were pushing for legislation that would help the Canadian producers. One day, Foster got a call from Francis Harmon, a Hollywood heavyweight. In the course of a conversation, a very brief conversation, Harmon said, I understand that you people are, are uh, uh, asking for a quote in American th uh, in uh, Canadian theaters. I said, yes, asking for a quota. And he said, you'd better quit it or I'll see that you're fired. Hollywood had a connection in Ottawa. It was the government of Canada. We in Canada knew, of course, that if we called on the film industry for help in any good war cause, that help would come. In our turn in Canada, we have tried to reciprocate. In our smaller way, of course, because we are a much smaller country. You in this country have quantity and quality. We in Canada have quality. <laughs> For the Liberal government, Mary Pickford, who had left Toronto in 1911, was sufficient Canadian content. 
Canada's biggest producers may not have been able to get through to C.D. Howe, but the door was open to Hollywood. There was a gathering desperation in the movie industry. It was 1948. TV had come to the States, and the movie theaters were already starting to close down. The captive Canadian market could make or break a picture. Eric Johnston, top representative of the major studios, had a suggestion. If Howe would keep his hands off the movie profits, Hollywood in return would promote the Canadian tourist trade. Hollywood would make and distribute Canadian shorts, shoot the odd feature on location in Canada. It would be a grand tourist promotion. And Hollywood had itself a deal. Here's company coming, the neighbors, the folks next door. The Canadian government signed the Canadian Cooperation Project, which effectively ended all hope for a Canadian feature industry. And for the thrill that comes once in a lifetime, what can equal the excitement of seeing your first real live Mountie? Come on, Aunt Emma, here's the high spot of your Canadian tour. Howe didn't seem to understand what he had done. He was quoted in Variety as saying that feature films would start rolling at once in Canada in a big way. Just why he drew this conclusion, nobody ever found out. American movie crews did occasionally come to Canada. Bing Crosby yodeled in the Canadian Rockies. Marilyn Monroe pouted before Niagara Falls. The only Canadian content, once again, was scenery. Now we shall smoke the pipe of peace. Indian, and American, and Canadian. We celebrate the peace and friendship of our three peoples who live on this northern frontier. There was a Hollywood operative, Blake Owensmith, who was charged with drawing up a list of Canadian references to be dropped, when possible, into the mouths of movie stars. Nightbirds. I haven't heard them before. Well, uh, they're sort of a special kind. They live up in the hills. Uh... Red Wing Orioles. Yeah, yeah, Red Wing Orioles from Canada. Yeah, from Canada. Warner Brothers were making a picture called Bend of the River, in which Jimmy Stewart was the wagon master of a train going through the Rockies in Oregon. And when I was reading the script prior to production, I noticed that uh, the train got in difficulties and got lost. So I realized they were in Oregon and the Canadian border was not far away, so I figured, well, we would try and get a reference into Canada without being too obvious. So I went to Warner Brothers and I talked to the writer, who was agreeable, but he said, uh, have you got any ideas? And unfortunately, I hadn't. So he thought a minute, he said, well, I tell you what we think we can do. We'll have this assistant to Jimmy Stewart point up and say, when you see those birds flying? Red wing Orioles. Yeah. From Canada, huh? The Canadian government was perfectly satisfied. Hollywood was absolutely delighted. Cabinet ministers were invited to Hollywood, and glowing references were made to them in a Hollywood memo. Bob Winters, as you very likely know, is as swell a guy as Mike Pearson. We've got to know him pretty well, and have sewed him up tight on the project. We will certainly have a very strong man in our corner of the cabinet for any future matter that may come up in which we might need help and understanding from the Canadian government. The American government itself had finally used its antitrust laws to break the Hollywood stranglehold on the theater chains. But there was no such trouble from the Canadian government. Paramount Pictures continued to own and operate the huge Famous Players Theater chain without interference. There was a clubby atmosphere. Hollywood representatives were treated to large Canadian luncheons at the Rideau Club that watering hole of official Ottawa. To protect Hollywood interests in Ottawa, there was the American ambassador, Lawrence Steinhardt, whose family was reported to own a large chunk of Warner Brothers. When J.J. Fitzgibbons, the president of Famous Players, let it be known that when television came to Canada, he would like to have a network, Ambassador Steinhardt interceded on his behalf 
and reported that C.D. Howe was well disposed towards the idea. When Louis Saint Laurent stopped being Prime Minister, he was placed on the board of directors of famous players. Of the private producers in Canada, only the French-Canadian Langlais put up much of a fight. I am afraid that I was a, a Franco voice in the desert, uh, a waspish desert in Canada. <laughs> and, uh, uh, because they did not believe, uh, there was no reason why the average English-speaking Canadian would believe that Canadian film industry meant anything. The American film industry satisfied him. And so, in the great post-war boom, Canada became the third richest country in the world. But alone in the Western world, Canada's movie audiences had no heroes of their own, no lovers, no beloved clowns, not even any Canadian villains. Perhaps the tragedy of the times was the fact that Canadians didn't seem to notice that anything was missing. The National Film Board, without a war to fight, had been searching for a purpose. Much of their work in the late 40s embraced the naive euphoria of the post-war boom. Toronto's nightlife, once a bit on the quiet side, has acquired a new gaiety and variety. Scores of new eating places and nightclubs now add to the neon glamour of Toronto after dark. I think Toronto is a wonderful town, smart and up to date, just like a good American city. Makes me feel like I'm back in Cleveland. As for Mr. McConaughey, he speaks for himself in the immortal words. Oh, Toronto is a great town for a visit, but it's too big for me. I wouldn't live here if you gave me the place. The NFB had become the biggest documentary and cartoon agency in the world, and there was a feeling it should be tackling the bigger global issues. In 1948, it did. NFB director Grant McLean was in China during the great civil war between the decaying regime of Chiang Kai-shek and the communist armies of Mao Zedong. The responsibility for fulfilling Sun's goals fell upon his successor, Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek. A weighty responsibility. McLean filmed the unfolding cataclysm in China and put it together in an epic film called The People Between. He was taken to the mountain headquarters of the remote Red Prophet Mao. From the north has arisen another claimant to the mantle of Sun, Mao Zedong, tobacco grower, leader of China's Communist Party. Mao is little known and less photographed. Adopting the methods of guerrilla warfare, he organized Chinese villagers and farmers into fighting forces. Because the film dealt with external affairs, McLean had to show it to Mike Pearson. Well, when the lights came on, uh, Pearson stood up and uh, said some very nice things about the, the quality of the film as a piece of film, but said that the government couldn't allow its release because uh, it indicated, naturally, that there were two governments in China and he didn't think that Canada should recognize that. I think it probably set our relations back with China a good many years. It was a terrible mistake. I don't think External Affairs was terribly concerned about the film board. I think they were more concerned, being career cowards basically, that no film should be shown in the embassies abroad, and the embassies all had film libraries, uh, that showed that, there was, that Canadians weren't anything else than really Americans in disguise. The film was finally released three years later in a laundered version. But the Korean War had begun, and it was booed off the Canadian screens as pro-communist propaganda. For the enemies of the film board, McLean's movie couldn't have come at a better time. 
Calling the House Un-American Activities Committee to order, Chairman J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey opens an inquiry into possible communist penetration of the Hollywood film industry. The committee is seeking to determine if Red Party members have reached the screen with subversive propaganda. In the teeth of the Cold War, fear of communism had reached hysterical proportions. The reputations of thousands of innocent Americans were destroyed in the great inquisitorial witch hunt. It spilled over into Canada, and the fear of communism dominated political debate. When such an organization as communism builds up and works and undermines in such a way as to destroy our rights, to take them from us, it is the duty. The state must remove that organization and all that it stands for. The RCMP had compiled a list of 36 suspected Red sympathizers at work at the National Film Board. As a result, the Army, Navy, and Air Force refused to allow the Film Board to make films related to national security. The story was leaked to the Financial Post. Ross McLean dismissed the RCMP list as rubbish. In any case, uh, I felt that uh, uh, in... Uh, uh, indiscretions probably had been um, committed, but uh, nothing that could be considered subversive or anything of the sort. So in that case, I didn't ask anyone to resign or leave or anything of the sort. A lifelong civil servant, Ross McLean, was fired. Arthur Irwin, editor of McLean's magazine, was called to Ottawa. It was known that Irwin was looking for an ambassadorship. Bob Winters and Mike Pearson convinced Irwin that if he cleaned out the film board, he might get to be an ambassador. He says, I hear you might be interested in external affairs. He says, we want you to take over the National Film Board. And I said, good God, Norman. That, at the moment, is the toughest job in Ottawa. He said, that's it exactly. When I got there, I was handed a list of 36 names of employees of the board. Uh, I think there were 579 on staff at the time, if I remember correctly. And this list was divided into three sections. A, these were security risks. B, probable security risks. C, possible security risks. I don't think the word investigation was used, but cleanup was, was the word that's in my memory. And uh, so, in a sense, we all sort of were padding away there and waiting for the summons <laughs> to appear. There seemed to be three clear cases of people who could be real security risks. The rest, no. There are all kinds of people. There have been people who have been foolish. There was one fellow who got up and heckled Jimmy Gardner, the Minister of Agriculture in Saskatchewan. He was a prominent, uh, this fellow was a prominent CCFer. And, of course, in the minds of some people, he was a communist. It came to the stage that there was a building up, I felt, of tremendous fear. I, I can't think of another word. Um, people, um, it came to the stage where people who had been friends, uh, film friends all their lives, um, see there were these subtle, uh, subtle things going on. Uh, we weren't accused of anything. But it was suggested that we were enemies of our country, some of us. Well, who of us were enemies of our country? <laughs> and uh, there was a t tendency for people to pass each other on the street without uh, acknowledging each other. It, it reached a, a really um, frightening and uh, discouraging uh, stage. In the end, Irwin agreed to fire three people. To some, Irwin was branded as a witch hunter. But his friends could argue with some justification that if he hadn't sacrificed the three, many more would have fallen victim to bureaucratic stupidity. If the film board were not a hotbed of communism, it had become inefficient, arrogant, and elitist. Irwin cleaned up the administration. To clean up their image, he fell into some luck. Princess Elizabeth had come to visit, and who could attack an organization that makes films on royalty? Besides, it was good box office. With an American distributor, the NFB featurette Royal Journey 
became the biggest English-Canadian box office success since 1919. It was very gay and very noisy, and most moving, too, when the children sang Dieu sauve le roi. If any filmmaker should have fallen victim to the great red witch hunt, it should have been Norman McLaren. The great animator had been invited to China and had come back disgusted by the corruption of the Chiang Kai-shek regime. He had been much more impressed by the communists of Mao Zedong. So I developed a kind of uh, empathy for them and, uh, and uh, kind of identified myself with the whole <laughs> new effort <laughs> so that when I came back to Canada and the Korean War had started, and here was I in Canada on one side and the Chinese on the other side, I felt very strongly the effect of war on two good people who were <laughs> fighting each other. And uh, this intensity of feeling about war made me make neighbors. Neighbors told the story in eight minutes of two men fighting over a flower. I don't consider Neighbors a political film. It's primarily a moral film. It's a parable with a moral just to it and applies to any human beings anywhere. It crossed my mind during the atmosphere of that McCarthy period that it might be construed as a subversive film because it talked about peace, and peace was a dirty word in that area. Official Hollywood, who hunted down pacifists with an unquenchable enthusiasm, presented the Canadian Consul General with an Academy Award for Norman McLaren's neighbors. But the Canadian movie reputation abroad no longer rested on McLaren's talents alone. There was a growing body of filmmakers who had started to make movies that did not imitate either the British or the Americans. A unique Canadian film style had finally evolved. Cartoons like Romance of Transportation had a fine sense of irony and a dry wit that was quite unlike anything else being done. The face of Canada was changed. Steam-powered railway locomotives made it possible for the far-flung provinces of British North America to be joined in one nation. Canadians had learned to laugh at themselves. And in a world of rampant patriotism, this refreshing new approach delighted movie audiences around the world. Of all the problems confronting the first Trans-Canada line, one was most puzzling. The Rockies. In spite of formidable difficulties, the mountains did not long defy the engineers. In a series of bold projects, they attacked the barrier from the west as well as from the east with unbelievable resourcefulness and immense daring. In Quebec, where films had tended to romanticize the old rural values, a new breed of movie maker, Raymond Garceau, Jean Paladi, Bernard Devlin, had begun to make movies that reflected the new urban focus of Quebec. It's 
c'est l'ego dominant le libido. Si tu es un gars que tu connais, <rire> tu vois, Paul, personne ne la comprend, ta peinture moderne. Across Canada, filmmakers were going back to their roots and discovering their art. The broad, sweeping geopolitical documentary was gone. In its place was the short, simple film, concentrating not on loud and empty generalization, but on the daily particulars of an individual human being. With this brief That's classic, Paul Tomkowitz, street railway switchman, Director Roman Kreuter of Winnipeg influenced the direction of filmmaking all over the world. In Alberta, Colin Lowe and Wolf Koenig created a new kind of western, where Roy Rogers didn't sing, and one felt only the splendid silence of the prairies. Distribution seemed to be the only problem. How to get the movies to the people. And then came television. It was 1952, and for the first time, a mass audience could be reached with the flick of a switch. Canadians, if they wanted to, could now watch themselves every night in their living rooms. But it remained to be seen whether television would be a mirror reflecting the Canadian personality, or whether it would be a window through which Canadians would continue to stare into the blinding light of American mass culture. It would not be the short-sighted politicians nor the Hollywood hustlers who would make that decision. It would be up to the Canadian people, and they would have no one to blame but themselves. <laughs> 